Um, here I am talking about um, something that's not new to researchers. Like, uh, plenty of people know what I'm going to point out, but it's something that a lot of people just know quietly. And it's a, it's a, it's a cool fact about variational inference and its link to a lot of the ways we train deep networks. And um, the first half of this, I didn't mention, but the, the most of the first part of this is material from this paper, uh, Practical Variational Inference for Neural Networks. This is by Alex Graves. Um, it's from like 2011. And, um, and then toward the end, I'm going to fade into talking about this other one, Variational Dropout and the Local Reparameterization Trick. Um, I'm going to talk about this just a little bit, certain parts I'm going to, I'm going to discuss. Uh, so I titled this, uh, Variational Inference as a Taxonomy for Training Deep Networks. Uh, I don't use the word taxonomy very often, but it's, it's useful here. Uh, when somebody talks about a taxonomy, uh, an example they'll often use is uh, the periodic table is a taxonomy for elements uh, and the discovery of the periodic table allowed us to arrange everything in a way where we were able to start looking for gaps in between them. It gave us a way to just organize everything. Uh, and that's kind of what a taxonomy is. It's, it's, a, it's a useful thing. And um, it gives you a way of, of mentally arranging things you already know about. Uh, and now here I'm going to point out that uh, variational inference, which I'll define shortly. A lot of people know about it at least a, a little bit, but I'll, I'll try to just make it seem straightforward. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll lay that out and then talk about this, t this table of how method, various methods fit into variational inference. So uh, you can think of training a network, training a neural network as um, and, and specifically, I'm going to focus on classification here. Um, it, so you're given a set of inputs, a set of labels, and you're learning uh, a model from that. You can think of training a neural network as being given a set of inputs and labels, uh, data set X is data set inputs, and Y is the labels for those, and inferring a probability distribution over what the weights for that model might be. And uh, these numbers, the, the idea of a set of weights having a certain probability of, of being the correct ones, um, is, is that's actually like a well-defined thing. It's not just hand wavy. Um, if uh, if your model if your model outputs probabilities, if if what it does is it takes inputs and it says this is a coffee cup with probability A, uh, it's a marker with probability B, etc. Um, that you can now invert this probability distribution to figure out what weights uh, would have been the best at giving those classifications. Uh, though in doing that, um, in doing that, you either implicitly or explicitly have some, some prior over the weights. Um, you have some initial estimate of them, or, or you have some notion of what weights are more likely to be correct than others. Um, so this is where the word regularization comes in. This notion of having a having this idea that like, hey, uh, large weights are less probable than small weights, or uh, or networks are sparse, or you, all all sorts of you can have these priors um, encoded into into this term. But the, the the point is, if you can explicitly state what your prior is on the weights, um, and if your if your model outputs a probability distribution like this, then this is a well defined uh, this 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 idea of having a uh, this idea of a certain weight matrix having a probability of being the correct one is is like well defined. It's a it's a real thing. Um, so variational inference is um, is choosing to um, create your own probability distribution over W and and optimizing it, uh, optimizing some function so that it uh, more close, so that it closely approximates the actual one. Uh, and the actual one is this big, complicated joint distribution, this big thing like, you know, um, 
it is it is assigning a certain probability to the matrix as a whole, and then it's assigning a different probability to a different matrix as a whole. It's a big complicated thing that you can't visualize. Uh, and in variational inference, you take some much simpler probability distribution um, and th that you can visualize and you and you tune it. Um, and the, the 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 core thing you're doing here, and I, and I just want um, I wanted to make this seem simple. Uh, it, the core thing you're doing here is you're maximizing the likelihood of the set of labels and the inputs you are given uh, by by tweaking that distribution. This is this is this is the log likelihood. This is with with a with a with a neural network. Log likelihood is is how you is how we, is your error function, uh, and. So th th this is very much like training a neural network, uh, and and you also want to minimize the divergence from your prior over the weights. Uh, this is a regularization term. This is um, how how different are the weights I arrived at from my prior distribution over the weights. So you have these two kind of conflicting things that you're optimizing, and and. Um, and this can be sh shown. You can it can be shown that by by doing that thing, maximizing that, mi minimizing the divergence, um, you are finding the Q. The, you, you are finding the distribution, of, um, and you, and you and your approximate family that is closest to um, to the to the correct one. Uh, you are by by doing by. Um, by optimizing this, you are optimizing this. You're making this smaller. Well, you can't say when you say it's the correct one. It, it, it's it's uh, the correct one is this Q. Uh, but, uh, what do you mean by the correct one? Um, you are finding the Q that is closest to this, the closest possible one. Uh, it's it, you are not you're not yeah un this. under the restrictions of the form of Q. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so and yes, and Q is often probably very simplistic. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's it's like it might be very different from the best one. Yeah, like you're you're like searching this like this Q, this family, uh, Q five. Right. You're you're moving around this family, to trying to find like the distribution that is um, closest to your actual to P of the actual one, uh, given, etc. Is that your actual one live, lives off in this space somewhere that is unreachable if you're stuck on this, you know, this manifold of um, of functions that that are that is given to you by by Q. Um, but you're finding the one that's closest by a distance metric by this distance metric. How does that's a question? Yeah. So um, by not trying to address the huge seeping matrix, you know, the, the full space. Is there any way to qualitative saying what we're giving up by accepting Q naught as a uh, as a standard for it? Well, just the easy statement to make is you are certainly not going to um, discover P. You're, you're, sorry, you're not. You're certainly not going to discover the correct distribution. Um, that's the best answer I can give. Uh, okay, so uh, what I was trying to back into was a notion of obviously there's a Vast space of cues. This is one particular instantiation of it. Uh, I'm assuming it's kind of a reprojection. Your this is lower dimensional, or at least as far as the number of variables in the distribution go. That's the, the advantage of it that it's copyable. Um, but I was just wondering, um, have, are there other ways of approaching this? Not this particular uh, formula, but are there other ways of uh, are there other families of Q that don't take this particular approach? All, all there is, because here I haven't really specified yeah, the family Q of Q. Is, yeah, this is independent of the families of Q. Like I, here I haven't uh, said anything about it yet, oh, about what Q is. A Q could be any, in, as far as you said, a Q could be anything. Yeah. It could be. I haven't even said the factorized thing yet, the, 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 the idea of separating it into a bunch of things. Yeah. Although that is what inevitably happens. Okay, so let me ask you this. Is there a way of bounding how far you are from what the optimal could be? Is there a way of knowing? I, I don't think there's, there's it's, 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 not, it's unknowable. Yeah, it's unknowable. It, it's unknowable how far you are from it. 
Now, there's, now, it's pretty much always better to give it as powerful of a distribution as you can, uh, uh, as flexible of a distribution as you can. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, it's always better to do that. Other people may, who, who are more experienced may actually be able to contribute to that. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure it's well defined what the optimal P of W given X, Y is. Um, well, I think it is. Uh, well, what, what? Uh, it, it is something, you, you could, um, I could write out the, the Bayes rule version of this, how to calculate this, and it's going to involve integrating over all possible weights to compute it. It's going to be something that, is, that exists, but is intractable. So presumably the, the full ceiling thing would be every possible joint distribution of every matrix coefficient against every matrix coefficient. That's right. kind of the raw ceiling thing. Right? Yeah, that's why it exposed. That's why you can do this for absolutely minimal network with like two weights. You can actually plot that out, what that space looks like, but as soon as you have any number, it, it, yeah, forget it. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. so you're basically back into the person dimensionality the wrong, uh, the wrong way <laughs> in some sense. Well, Bayesian stuff always runs into this yes. of dimensionality and stuff. But I guess well, the reason why I'm saying it's, in some sense, the best P of W given X, Y, the, the, the best W is the stuff that's going to work on future inputs. Uh, well, not on this yeah, particular data set. So in, in that it's sense, I'm saying it's not really. That's not all. You can't even define it really sure, given that, this, this data set. You really yeah. have to define it in terms of all future data points. Yeah. Which you um, have no way of scoping. Yeah. Which you have no right. way of scoping. So that's really what you're trying to optimize. Right. 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 So here, here I'm just that's saying, what I meant. yeah, given a prior and given this, uh, um, anyway, given a prior, given y your model itself, like uh, how many weights there are, um, this is a well defined thing. However, that's not like that's it. your point as well as well received. That uh, that's not like you have actually solved how to classify these objects because your prior might not be right or uh, some other way you have set up the problem might be wrong. Still, so, yeah. So um, this gets me into um, so you have two decisions to make when you when you perform variational inference. Um, two two high level decisions. One is you choose your Q, you choose what is the approximating function you're going to use. And the other is you choose your prior over the weights. Um, now here's like the little fun fact, the part that I just wanted to make sure people knew. Um, so let's start with some, a really simple distribution. Uh, and I'll, I'll just define this. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it. But a delta distribution, um, which is sort of a hack. It's sort of a cheeky way of saying that, like, hey, you want a probability distribution? Fine, I'm going to give you a delta. Uh, it's a way of providing a non-distribution. It's a way of saying, like, OK, you want a probability distribution? I'm going to put infinite probability mass on a specific set of weights. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to, it's not a probability the distribution. Distribution is not a distribution in the sense that we understand it, but of course, the derived yeah. pulse is also distributed. Yeah. Thing. And the, right. the and the area under this curve is one. <laughs> the or the area under with the zero of the amplitude is is infinite. So uh, yeah, yeah. I multiply to one. And then so an integral that captures that that captures this is gonna be one. That's just the definition of it. It's a it's a Q hack. Uh, so if you choose Q to be a set of these, which is just to say you're you're just tuning a bunch of weights. Um, and you don't really define a prior. You assume it's just a uniform. All weights are equally likely. Um, what comes out of that is your standard way of training a deep neural network or a batch gradient descent. If, if you're passing the entire data set, it's, it's, like, it's like performing gradient descent on your entire d data set. Um, it is how we train networks or the, 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 the basic way of doing it. If you're using, uh, if you're using negative log likelihood as your loss function, which we usually do. Uh, if, you're, if you're using softmax, that's typically what you do. That's basically saying, well, but there's no uncertain, there's going to be no uncertainty about what the weight is. Once we find the weight, that is what it's going to be. Uh, and we just treat it as a fixed point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you don't need to integrate over the uncertainty interval or anything like that. Yeah. Now, if you take that and um, make and keep 
keep your Q function the same, uh, but have a have more of a prior on what the weights are, what weights are more likely to be than others. If, if you set that prior to be Gaussian, you expect a Gaussian distribution of weights uh, with the with the mean at, at zero, and you choose some variance. Uh, that you take that, do the math. What pops out is your standard batch gradient descent. Uh, with L2 regularization or weight decay. Uh, so when you do the most common way, probably the most common way of training networks, uh, you are performing variational inference with a delta distribution uh, with delta and, and Gaussian prior on the weights. Uh, there's a very similar story you can tell with L1 regularization. Uh, um, that's the same except with a Laplace distribution. Uh, Laplace is like two exponentials, it's like a symmetric thing. Gaussian is like a bell curved Laplace is like two exponentials. But otherwise, um, yeah, so, uh, re regular batch gradient descent with L1 regularization is the same thing as variational inference with this prior and that, um, that distribution. Where would L0 regularization fit in then? I don't know. And the funny thing is that I, I, sh I should know that because there's like something that, the appendix of the paper on L0 regularization has a section relating it to variational inference, but I hadn't read that, that, I haven't read that if, yet. If I, if I use induction, you have an exponential squared for your L2, you have an exponential to the first power for that, so I might think that maybe it's a oh. linear function. It's a what function? Linear, pulls off linearly rather than exponentially. I don't know. That is an interesting fair, idea. Fair, fair just the idea that that is a square and there's some yeah. to the minus one and then. You might be right. Maybe, yeah. Or it could, could be overfitting to the <laughs> next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 50 50. People it's like one of these IQ test questions. You know? <laughs> What's the next? Yeah. People often point out with L0 that. Um, that L, the L0 is kind of different. It's almost maybe misnamed. It, so what you're saying would probably be true if L0 were more mathematically rigorous. But you, you might be right. That's a, that's a good, that's a good <laughs> talk, the idea of the squared and everything. And just, uh, just so I understand that better. So you're saying for L2 regularization, from a variational standpoint, it just says we don't know what the variance is. We're going to find that uh, through our training. Yes. If you uh, uh, if, if you choose to then take a variational approach to it and um, uh, and because in variational inference you don't necessarily have to um, tune every parameter if you want you can keep this fixed um, and um, tuning this is similar to um, tuning the weight decay constant uh, right so the, the weight decay constant will Leads to a particular variance. Is that what you're? Uh, Every weight yes. decay constant assumes the types yes, of the, variance. Yes, the, the way that, yes, exactly. There's a mapping okay. from weight decay constants to the vari variance. Is interesting. Yeah. And then, but even in so what's even in those cases, people tend to initialize the weights with a uniform distribution. So yeah. you're kind of initializing your weights uniform. with something that does not match your prior on the weights, which is kind of bizarre. Right. People still, when you're doing weight decay, people yeah. still do this whatever came in initialization or whatever. Right. That's that's particularly that's uniform. But it seems kind of bizarre to initialize if you're explicitly assuming a Gaussian prior on the yeah. weights, you're initializing it with a uniform distribution. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't like, have, I don't have. Why don't we right initialize it when you pick weight decay? You know what the variance is. Why don't you initialize it with that variance? I don't know. Yeah, that's a <laughs> good observation. <laughs> Oh yeah, can you turn on the lights, please? Oh yeah. Thank you. Now, briefly, I'll point out that um, that now there's this whole other set of methods available to us. You can now t put a more complicated distribution in here. Um, and anyway, a set of other possibilities become possible. The the paper I um, the the Graves paper. Um, about variational inference is kind of where I got all this information. The idea that um, that all of this, all of this, collapses down onto these things we've already been doing. Um, 
this is totally possible. I'm not going to talk about it very much right here, but th this is just a, this is this is a very variational uh, <laughs> a, a approach to training a network. Um, but now I want to move into um, some something that's just like interesting. Of now we're going to kind of go the other direction. Um, let's take a let's take something we're already doing and work backward and figure out what we've been doing all along in, in variation of language. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is basically what the second paper did about uh, variational dropout. Um, so, so here I'm just talking about standard batch gradient descent or mini batch gradient descent uh, with dropout. Uh, dropout being where you're just randomly dropping out uh, units. Uh, well, it's 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 not simple to just say to just answer this question. It takes some um, it takes a lot of thought to 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 figure out how do you describe this in variational terms. And there's kind of a two step process. Uh, so um, dropout shortly after it came out, it was also pointed out that um, you can get pretty much um, equal performance with faster training using something called. Gaussian dropout, or they, they call it that because it's, uh, they make a case that is fundamentally the same in the sense that, so, so what Gaussian dropout is, is you simply multiply each acti activation, each, each cell activation, by some noisy constant that's, noise, that's Gaussian distributed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they make a case that, that these are actually the same. Um, they make the case using the central limit theorem, um, the idea that if if a unit is receiving a set of inputs, and all those inputs are each dropping out with some probability, um, central limit theory theorem. This is like a sum of Bernoulli variables, but the sum of a set of variables is always going to trend toward Gaussian. Uh, so the idea is that um, that you are still essentially adding the same type of noise to the network by doing this, but you're no longer dropping out units, so you can now train much faster because every unit is still being trained every iteration. One con small confusion I have. Yeah. Uh, with dropout, you don't use it during inference. They only use it during training, typically. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So where is the inference piece of this? Did, are they saying that you would the network do it during inference? Too? No, uh, you wouldn't do it during an inference. Um, you're, here you're multiplying by a constant, so you're um, sometimes it's increasing it, sometimes it's decreasing it. Right, but only during training. During training, yeah. So uh, it's a stochastic dropout. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It, it's a very doing inference. It's you're not doing that. I'm, I'm a little con just confused about terms here. The question where, is, where is you actually run the network? Are the Gaussians still there? No, but no. they're not. So that, then then I would. Well, yeah. but if there was implied noise being fed into the input, then it would be modeling it, right? I mean, it's basically making it resistant to those noise, the noise. Yeah, but I thought part of the... I'm just uh, con just confused about terms because during the testing phase of the quote-unquote inference phrase, right. you're not doing the dropout anymore. Um, and so you're not really doing a variational process during inference. Well, we're not doing oh, oh, no, no, keep in mind that... Um, here, when I'm talking about doing a variational process, I am, we're solving, we're figuring out what are the weights uh, during yeah. learning. Okay. But your inference might still choose a set of fixed weights. Okay. You, it's like you, the fact that you might be, the fact that you might be storing a variance for each weight is still only used during learning in most cases. Right. Okay, so they're not really doing a variational pro uh, technique during the inference correct piece, but it's correct. called variational inference uh, the, it's variational inference of, of the weights that's what this is okay. now now the, you might be overlapping this with them I don't want to get too deep into variational autoencoders right now but variational I think maybe that's why I was getting confused right. we are inferring yeah, yeah, yeah. weights not inferring outcomes W and Correct, the but there are variational techniques where they try to integrate right. over the uncertainty. Uh, so yeah, so but that's but why I was getting variational autoencoders really are essentially performing variational inference during inference. inference yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this this is my confusion. Yeah. And I think it's best to not talk about variational autoencoders okay. in this, okay. in this okay. presentation. Okay. I I thought this was 
Okay. So variational, the term variational. So, so is, in a way, it needs to be a of work. It should be really variational training. This variational inference of the weights. Okay. Variational inference predates, well, okay. Yeah, I, of I, course, I, nothing predates neural nets, but like. Um, well, no, no, the, these basic ideas predate neural nets. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, right. But I'm just saying, when we see this term in this context, variational inference, in our minds, we should be really thinking about variational training. Because you're, you're trying to infer the weights, not, as you said, outcomes. Right. Yeah, you are yeah. properly inferring weights. So right. the, the, right. the term inference is still correct. It's, still correct, it's just not used how yeah. we use it most of the time when yeah. we're saying inference, we mean inferring Y, not W. Yeah, in a Bayesian sense, it's still correct. Right. Yeah, there, there, there are chapters of textbooks called that are, I think the <laughs> David McKay textbook, I think, has a chapter called Inference as Learning. We're learning as inference yeah. is one of those two. Okay. The point is that this this the, the, this idea of applying inference to learning is a, is a thing. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, it's 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 a, it's a trap we we avoid. It. <laughs> Mark, Marcus, yeah. you mentioned this. Um, they proved that the second method is equal to the first. So why are people still using the first dropout method using like Bernoulli distribution? I don't know. Uh, this this is something I'm curious about. I, it, at this point, I am well read up to like 2015, okay. and, and I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look at the framework, they still implement like the old way. Yeah, like so I am curious stuff. about that as well. This is roughly I wrote roughly here because as this paper points out, um, um, this paper makes the claim they're the same. Um, this paper, the second one, the variational dropout one, says that they're almost the same. This 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 is a little hand wavy. There's yeah. things that this is leaving out. And it, it, who knows, those may have turned out to be more. My answer to that, I think, is that batch norm basically killed dropout. Mm. Is that when batch norm came in, uh, uh, right. dropout really doesn't help anymore. Then, but batch norm helps happen. a lot of things. Mm. Um, and and variations of normalization and stuff are much more important. And then if you're doing that, you don't need dropout anymore. Right. I think that's my uh, feeling. I'm not machine learning enough to understand what you just said. Okay. <laughs> 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 no, I've updated my prior on <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now you know how I feel during your talks. <laughs> 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 I'm confirming <I'm fine. laughs> <laughs> my priors. Um, uh, no, can you just quickly explain the term batch norm? Uh, Batch norm basically tries to normalize the outputs of every layer, so they form fall into a Gaussian, neat Gaussian distribution, um, and that helps. Otherwise, these outputs can really blow up. Right, um, because and one one you know perpetuates all the one perpetu yeah. and, and so it's worse. You can think of it in neuroscience terms as a kind of uh, homeostasis, homeostasis kind of function that's happening at every layer. So they're right. renormalizing the outputs every every yeah. step. Cool. It's maintaining a balance. So you're turning it a, a kind of a, a Gaussian distribution dovetails into your notion of the summation of these Bernoulli variables can approximate a Gaussian. That's the kind of connection that you um, still get. I think this is different. I think this is like literally saying the range of outputs coming out of a layer right. uh, should uh, match a Gaussian. But the distribution of outputs coming out of a layer should match a Gaussian. That's different from applying Gaussian noise to the outputs. Okay. Like you could have Gaussian noise on the outputs without the outputs themselves being Gaussian. Uh, but are you actually applying it to the outputs or are you uh, applying it to the, uh, uh, the feeding through to the, to the hidden layers? I'm not sure I... Well, batch norm renormalizes the output of a layer Oh, uh, almost a Gaussian. Right, of right, every layer will right, right. now try to be a Gaussian. Okay, so if if you a, a Gaussian with a, a, I'm sorry, not just a Gaussian, but Gaussian with a very known limited distribution, of, mm -hmm. I think zero mean. And, okay, um, so let me. What are the and univariance? What are the what are the ways that I thought of dropout was that it basically tested, you know, uh, by removing certain inputs, it kind of made the, the whole network more robust against kind of failures in a kind of, you know, hard fashion. Uh, to me, I'm not sure I can relate that to, yeah, you achieve that by making the, the distribution Gaussian. Look, uh, 
Oh, oh, never mind. Yeah. Just, just making sure you realize that I think I think maybe you know this. Just making sure it's clear. In Dropout, you're performing it on every unit in the network. Basically, it's right. not just on the inputs. Yeah, so, and I think he's right. reacting. Yeah. I said with batch drop, you don't need drop, Dropout anymore, and they seem like very different things. Yeah. Right. Uh, which is true, and I don't know that there's a theoretical reason, but there's certainly empirically. Batch norm uh, with batch norm, you don't yeah. really need dropout anymore. It doesn't help in the ways that it would otherwise. There are different they, forms of regularization. And then there are regularization, yeah. yeah. And batch norm is more powerful than dropout. Okay, uh, I'll ask you offline if there's something that helped me connect. Uh, I'm not sure I have a good answer. You might know better. I don't. Okay, but you say empirically at least that yeah. seems to be the case. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a deeper connection there. I'd like to understand. <laughs> I'm going to continue with working backwards from <laughs> how this right. how to describe this variation. We've, we've been doing stuff on how to understand the cues and peaks. Yeah. Well, this is very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. So, so what I just pointed out was um, was that dropout is roughly the same as Gaussian dropout, uh, at, at least in a fundamental way of what it's what it's doing to the network. Um, now this second paper uh, came uh, as one as the um, he does a lot of these papers on variable, variational inference. Uh, the second one pointed out that um, if you do um, something like this, if you do something like this, where every weight has a um, has a mean and a variance, one trick for Computing this is to take these variances and r rather than having the weights be noisy, um, have the cells themselves be noisy. Have the have the have the output have the unit itself be noisy. Take the variances of all the weights and kind of collect them up at the cell and add the noise there instead of adding them to the adding the noise to the weights. Um, and basically, he worked in the other direction, saying that this is also equal to Quet Gaussian dropout, except where every unit has a different noise, a different, um, different variance. Um, so, so both of these drop dropout and this, with ignore this part, ignore the prior because that's that's the, that's the second part of the discovery. Um, they both converge on to what can be called Gaussian dropout. Uh, so now we have this interpretation that um, that that your standard way of training a neural network adding dropout um, is is in a sense performing variational inference where um, where you where every weight has well, the weight, uh, but it, it has a mean, um, and it also has a variance. But the variance is held fixed, but it's kind of fixed in the special way of um, of where it is. Its variance, the weight's variance, increases as the weight increases. Um, that's that's a comp This is a simple idea. You're multiplying a factor by the weight. To figure out how how, how it's um, how 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 much it varies, how big a margin of error is, and um, but in order to finish mapping this onto variational inference, you have to figure out okay now what what is your prior over the over the weights, and in this paper they pointed out that the implicit prior of this technique is that you have a log uniform distribution. Uh, I'll I'll show you brief. I'll show you very soon. What I mean by that, um, and I'll show you now. Be right back. Oh, <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> okay, yeah, it looks like this is all on the video. Uh, so um, the way these weights tend to um, be distributed. Here I'm showing four different example weights and their variances um, are like, if they're small, if they're near zero, then um, they have a lower variance. Uh, and if they're, if they're larger, they might vary over a larger range. Um, and 
I'll just go in order here. So the, the implication here, I'll talk about the, the, the prior in like 20 seconds. Um, the implication here, networks with dropout are roughly equivalent to networks with Gaussian weights um, and where the standard deviation or the variance is proportional to the, the weight itself, to the mean of the weight. Um, so the, the prior here, this log uniform prior, is that um, here I depicted it as um, each of these intervals, so weight being somewhere between 0.01 and 0.1, or being between 0.11, or being between 1 and 10, um, are equally likely, or they're equally probable. Um, under this prior, <laughs> what you're doing with, um, when you're doing, um, yeah, grading sound with dropout, is you are holding fixed some noise constant that's just used across everything. Um, you are keeping that with this again. You, you are you are choosing to do an optimization where you're holding this completely constant. Um, th this this term here, uh, by by because you're holding alpha constant, uh, this term here is being held. Uh, it's, it's never changing and you're optimizing this. And your alpha term is essentially choosing how, how precisely you're encoding your weights. Uh, the, oh, so the, the, the KO term becomes static, yeah. the, the, that divergence becomes static because you have the, because that yeah. logarithmic, right, okay, now I get it. Yeah, so, right, so that's the value of that transformation. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? Okay. So the Kuba treatment flips the emergence <laughs> between these two um, between these two probability distributions, right? Uh, that that is um, a subject like like easily changes, right? But if you have the same logarithmic mapping on these on these priors, then you can actually hold it constant, mm -hmm. and then you can then you can vary these uh, these other things. The the, the the alphas, right? Um, you know, to, to help with that side of the equation, because of course you're maximizing Holton. And so, and because because this is set up in this way, where the variance just automatically scales with the mean, um, that this is how you get this property where um, changing the means, changing the weights, does impact this, but it doesn't impact this. Uh, that that property holds when you have the log uniform prior. And that's the only dis that's the only distribution for which that property holds. Um, Very curious. We need both the 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 sort of definition of this of the sigma ideas and the log uniform prior to get KL to be fixed. Like we need both of those properties. Like the way how the yeah, I, I would say that um, you need holding alpha constant uh -huh. and having a log uniform prior. Yeah, those are the two requirements. Okay. And, and holding alpha constant is equivalent to having um, sigma squared always equal this. Uh, and so where I'm going with this is, um, so an implication from this that can become, so, so here, here like this is taking a method that's already out there working empirically and and looking at it from a kind of mathematical standpoint and, and saying what insights can we derive from that. Um, the, a, a conclusion or a, um, a, 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 yeah, a, a guess that, can, that, can, that this kind of votes on, I don't know the right way to say this, uh, is that, um, is, so if this method that is working empirically implicitly assumes this. Um, that implies that an optimal encoding scheme for weights will be to distribute your um, encoding scheme. Here I'm talking about like how you encode weights using integers or floating point or whatever. Um, it's going to distribute its codes, its binary codes, uniformly across this line. So, and conveniently, the floating point does exactly that. That's what floating point does. Um, yeah, floating point with larger numbers, floating point has a larger margin of error in an absolute sense. 
with smaller numbers, it has a smaller margin of error in an absolute sense. Uh, and so, in, in, and they point out in this paper that um, in, in choosing your alpha, in choosing your new noise term that you use in Gaussian dropout, or in choosing your dropout rate in standard dropout, uh, because alpha has an easy mapping to your dropout rate. It's one, one minus p over p. It's just a really straightforward thing. Um, you are at what you're doing in a sense is you're choosing how precise so that you encode the weights. And, um, and that's kind of what alpha is capturing. You can train networks of different alphas to, to get different um, precisions. And, um, and just very briefly, I'll point out that this paper goes into now full on variational dropout where you're allowed to train all these parameters. You can learn them all, and you can go even further. You can have a different alpha for every synapse, um, for every weight, uh, and that's all possible. And the, a second later paper, um, I forgot to, it's, it's Molkanov, Mol, Molikov, I, 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 Google sparse variational dropout. There is a, there's a or variational dropout causes this sparsifies networks. Um, when you have different alphas for every weight, it is a good way of sparsifying the network. You can think of it as taking every weight, um, widening, it, widening its curve, um, trying to make it where it requires as few bits as possible to represent, and then just keep widening it and widening it until it's not even doing anything, and at that point you remove it. Uh, and that's a form of sparsification. Uh, and <laughs> that's basically how this sparse variational drop, how, how, this, how this method works. Right, if, you're, if the actual value of the weight does not matter, yep. it's uniformly distributed, that is a yep. weight you can remove. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically. And, uh, yeah. Um, so, that's pretty much the end of the topic. Uh, it, I, I felt it was useful to, um, to have this, what I would say is somewhat of a taxonomy, a place you can mentally put these methods uh, in, 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 a, in a larger framework, and it might inspire uh, other methods, and and it lets us take existing methods and analyze them in an interesting way. Can I ask a, you don't have to answer this here, I'm just kind of curious, if when you're tuning, if you have the variance, right now you have a, the variance proportional to the square of the mean, if the variance I don't know. I, I mean, the one quick thing I'll point out is that I, my real answer is I don't know. It, now, I'll, I'll, just the quick thing I was going to say is this is equivalent to saying that the um, the standard deviation scaling with the mean, right? Uh, with the absolute value of the mean. But no, I don't. I don't have an answer to that. Okay, because then you would be moving from Gaussian to Poisson statistics, I think. I don't know. That is that is true, right? Because you would have a ratio of one between the, the variance and the mean. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering how we transform uh, this thing. Because what this is arguing here is fully point is essential in training, at least in, in these classifications. And quantization, you know, these, you know, that has implications of quantization. Say you don't have to answer it here, but it was just an observation that you know there might be a transformation of this whole problem if you change that proportionality. What is the biological final factor on excitatory weights in cortex? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is the ratio between the the the, the, the value of a, of an EPSP, right, so like effective conductance between two neurons, and it's uh, and its viability. You would think it would fall from the Because right? the, the weird thing is, if for one, it's quantized because no other information transaction is quantile because you either release a vesicle or you don't release a vesicle. You can release integer numbers of vesicles and they are typically the same. A small integer. Right, exactly. So you might you know have like an MPSP where they like, extend to release one vesicle. So there's a jump from zero to some value. And then you might release 13 or 
12 or 6 vesicles, right, depending on how strong your sandwich is. Uh, or at least how strong the pre-sandwich is. The post-sandwich obviously can then still modify that. But uh, I, like, I can't help but think of all of these things in the, in the biological distributions because the biological weight distributions are obviously not uniform and they're not Gaussian either. Uh, I look a little bit Laplacian in the sense that like most weights are non-existent, sparse, right? And then of the weights that exist, most weights are very weak. There's a shit ton of weak sandwiches, which of course Jeff would explain with uh, with all the uh, you know, like uh, the dendritic branches, right? Dendritic computation. That's that's why there's so many of them. But then there's also obviously a, a, a limit to how strong a synapse can get. So it does decay to, to zero in, in finite distance. And there are humps. So if you look at these distributions, strong synapses acquire a specific weight and they cannot grow beyond that because of homeostatic effects. I um, don't know exactly how that is for inhibitory weights, but they tend to be a lot more sort of like very strong inhibitory weights and weak inhibitory weights. So I'm thinking there's actually like probably a gap I've not seen a distribution on that. Because where I'm coming from is uh, when you look at sensors that are being quantum imaging sensors, uh, you start off at the low end with Poisson statistics where you have a you know, finite number of quantum coming on in, and you get enough of them, and then the noise statistics uh, shift from Poisson to, to Gaussian, and there's like a, there's a whole blend in there. But if you were talking about Finite small numbers. Right. Poisson is probably the more accurate model for modeling the neurophysiology. Right. Be but I wonder if anyone in, in neuroinformatics has sort of taken a look at that and would like give concrete numbers on that. Yeah, because that's I, I think that would be an essential part of any model of, from the way you've been describing these right. these finite numbers of you know you know micro millimolar calcium and the vesicles and everything. Everything looks highly quantized to some level. And if you get enough of them, obviously you can kind of say, close your eyes and say, gosh. I'm a little confused about this floating point thing. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that if you were to pick bits in a floating point representation randomly, you would get this property. Yeah. Right. But that's not what we do. Like in, in typical floating point math and typical the way it's used in deep learning systems, it's not exploiting this prior. Oh, right. 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 So it's actually the fact that we're, it's not like, oh, just by magically using floating point, we're going to be in this regime. You still have to explicitly take that into account. Well, this right. is prior to any nonlinear function that you're Well, I'm, what I'm saying is like when we... He's saying when, when, when we generate random numbers, we don't do this? Is yeah, that, we, we don't, don't do this because we're sure. doing it uniformly between 0 and 1 or whatever it is. Or we're not actually picking bits in a floating point right. representation randomly. That's oh. what you need to get this property. Right. And when we do the math, we're not we're fighting against this property in right. some sense. Right? Uh, so all of the fact that we're using floating point representation does not make this any easier to do. It's not like we... You see what I mean? It's, it's not like right, we're right, it right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, right, uh, and because we're using uh, we're using so many bits that we're not even at a point where it matters. Uh, even uh, if we weren't, even if we had a smaller one, every all the math is set up to fight against this. So like, <laughs> no, okay, yeah, so yeah, do yeah. do proper math despite this problem. So uh, I guess the intuition I'm giving is like um, is. If uh, suppose um, like suppose like uh, one one way like weight forty two just in that clash with these numbers over here equals zero point one plus or minus um, er er an error epsilon yeah um, the weight forty three uh, equals like one point two plus or minus an epsilon. Um, I'm saying that um, that it's appealing for this epsilon to be smaller than this epsilon. Yeah, right. Uh, and um, I'd say we're not really at the breaking point of floating point uh, where that matters. But even if we were to use eight-bit floating point, yeah. where this would 
you know, the map would be set up to not exploit those properties. Well, the, the random number generation wouldn't, but the idea of if, if, we, if there are a limited number of weights that are even possible, if you're choosing how to distribute those weights, uh, you probably, at your higher numbers, you want the gaps between your possible weights to be larger. Right, most of the point point representations have a bias to them, so you can have positive negative exponents, but you can imagine that you only allow things one or smaller than one, and then you get this distribution. So you don't need the things that can get you two, four, eight, sixteen. No, you would only get this distribution if you pick the bits in the representation randomly. If you use a uniform random number generator, you would not get this distribution. It, it, I'm not really focused on random. Ran yeah, no, I, I, I just said, no, I'm just saying that's one example. Okay. But all the math we do, I'm not sure really would exploit this property. I, I guess I'm just saying ignore almost all the math uh, and just focus on what the network's doing during inference. Um, if you're focused on like true the, inference, not the, yeah, so not true inference, the a, a fully trained network, uh, yeah. and, and you're doing that and you have a limited number of weights right. that are even possible. I'm saying that distributing your weights like this is, pro is probably the optimal way of distributing them. It, it pro if you have a limited number of bits, you can encode it. This right. is probably so the you, best So you'd be approximating that function by having these little flat sections. Yeah. Uh, instead of a Gaussian, you'd have a flat section that's wider, further from zero. And narrower. Yeah. To so the, the, this would be like the point one. Yeah, this would yeah. be like the one point two. And this is probably a good way for an inference. Once you're performing. That's the right. But but you, but by doing that math with that representation does not assume a prior like that. Do you see what I mean? You have to explicitly do these techniques that they're that they're suggesting. Yeah, I, I think we're mostly in, in agreement just settling on certain things. Uh, the, the, I think the core. I'm just saying it's it's yeah. not it's just not like it's not like you do floating point, rep, you use a floating point representation, and you automatically get these priors. You don't. Uh, you just get right. this error. Yes, but the error will be yeah. different for different things, but you're not using that prior and doing a calculation. Not in doing the calculation. Yes, yeah, but right. you could argue that floating point was designed to be optimal for these types of number systems, or, or, or systems where yeah, that could be. error matters yeah, in yeah. this way. Yeah, that could be. I think that might be it. Okay. Good.